Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. So far in the Direct 3D videos I discussed the 3D12 initialization, work submission using command queues, command allocators and command lists, and we looked at how we could synchronize this work between CPU and GPU. We also implemented a descriptor heap allocator. So by now we know what descriptor heaps and descriptor handles are. Then I created our render surfaces using swap chains, and in the last episode, I wrote classes for creating texture resources, render targets, and depth buffers. Before we get to have a functioning direct 3D renderer, we need to go through a couple of more topics and create small classes and structures that will help us set up the renderer. So the next two topics that I'm going to talk about are the root signature and the pipeline state objects. In order to understand what these are and what their purpose is, I first need to give a high-level overview of the Direct3D12 graphics and compute pipelines. This is the traditional DirectX graphics pipeline. It consists of fixed function and programmable shader stages. The first versions of Direct3D only had fixed function stages, but pretty soon the first two programmable shader stages were introduced, the vertex and pixel shader stages. DirectX 10 added the geometry shader stage and DirectX 11 added the tessellation stages and the compute shader, which I'll get to in a minute. All stages prior to the rasterizer stage are collectively referred to as the geometry stages. In order to use this pipeline, at least a vertex shader needs to be set. All other stages are optional. A vertex shader processes one vertex at a time. In general, the vertices are read from a vertex buffer by the input assembler and passed to the vertex shader. Tessellation and geometry shaders can process one primitive at a time. The most used primitive type is a triangle, but there are more types of primitives defined in D3D, like different control point patch primitives that can be used with the tessellation stages. The fixed function rasterizer takes a triangle, line or point and determines which pixels are overlapped by that primitive. Then the pixel shader is invoked for each one of those pixels. Please keep in mind that I am omitting some details here that I'll get to eventually, but right now I only want to give a course overview and not distract you with a lot of details, which are easily forgotten anyway. The final stage is the output merger, which will write the results of the rasterizer and pixel shader to the render targets and depth buffer, if any. In 2020, Microsoft introduced an alternative to this pipeline which reduces the number of geometry stages and gives more flexibility for processing vertices. It also makes parallel processing of vertices more explicit, as I'll explain in a second. In this pipeline, all geometry stages have been replaced with just two stages, the mesh shader stage and the amplification shader stage, with the latter being optional. These shader stages are rather similar to the compute shader stage which runs the shaders in groups of threads. Invoking a mesh shader in this way explicitly processes multiple vertices in parallel. The amplification shader can be used to generate or reduce primitives in a way similar to the tessellation stages and geometry shader stage. In this series, I'll start with the old pipeline with the vertex shader and later on I'm also going to add support for mesh shaders. Of course, there is also the direct X ray tracing feature, but that's a story for another day. Finally, we have the compute pipeline, which has just one shader stage. We will use compute shaders when we do light culling for the forward plus render path. Looking back at the first pipeline I talked about, we see that we need to define a state for it in order to use it. For example, we need to attach shader programs, vertex and index buffers, and also tell it where to render the final image to. We can define such a state using a pipeline state object. There are a lot of settings that can be configured to define a pipeline state object. In this example, we have the input layout, which describes the format of the vertices, attach the vertex shader and a pixel shader, and also we defined a rasterizer state, 
Using a rasterizer state, we can, for example, tell the rasterizer to output a wireframe instead of solid triangles. We can then set this pipeline state while recording commands. Together with the geometry data, render targets, and depth tensile buffer, the pipeline is almost ready to execute recorded commands. It is almost ready because in general, we need to provide shader programs with more information about the objects that we are trying to render. For example, we often need to pass the camera and objects positions and the list of shader resource views of textures. Direct3D12's mechanism for passing this data to the shaders is by using a root signature, which is a tiny buffer that is just 256 bytes in length, or 64 slots of 4 bytes each. We can put any 32-bit constant directly in such a slot. Further, we can put certain resource view types in the buffer. This will, however, take two slots. Finally, we can put a descriptor table in the buffer, which defines one or more descriptor ranges in the descriptor heap. This takes one slot of space. Each piece of information in this buffer is called a root parameter. Since we can put pretty much anything in this buffer, we need to describe how this data should be interpreted. This is done using a root signature description, which takes an array of root parameters. In today's video, I am going to show you how we can create a root signature. Let's write a function that contains an example of the steps needed to create a root signature. We can then call this function to see if it succeeds in doing that. The API function that creates a root signature is a function from ID3D12 device interface called, unsurprisingly, create root signature. When we look at its parameters, we see that it needs an interface pointer where it will put the resulting root signature, but to do so, it also needs a pointer to a buffer that contains a serialized root signature description. By the way, I'm just putting this function here in core CPP for the purpose of demonstration and will remove it later when we don't need it anymore. To serialize a root signature description, we can use a function that is called d3d12 serialized version root signature. This function takes a pointer to a d3d12 version root signature description and outputs an id3d blob interface pointer that contains the buffer we need. It also outputs a blob containing any errors that might have occurred. We can use the root signature blob to get the serialized result and pass it to the API function. We also do the usual checks that would halt the application in debug build if anything fails. I'm going to print the error message to the Visual Studio's output panel in case serialization fails. Also, don't forget to release any interfaces that we have at the end. What I did here is not watertight, but it will do for now since this is just an example. Next, we need to choose which version of root signature description we want to use. We can do this by filling in a version root signature description. This structure contains a union of root signature descriptions, and we need to tell the API which one to use by specifying the version. Using version 1.1 enables the drivers to do some optimizations with regard to volatility or staticness of descriptors and resources. Therefore, I'm going to use this version, and because of this, we need to fill in a d3d12 root signature desk1 structure. Then we can pass the pointer to version description to the serialization function. 
Let's look at root signature desk one structure. Here we can set a pointer to an array of root parameters and another pointer to an array of static samplers. In addition, we can set flags for the root signature. For this example, I'm going to create three root parameters, one for each type of parameter that we can use, namely root constants, root descriptor, and root descriptor table. So let's define an array of D3D12 root parameters with three elements. Inspecting the definition of this structure, it is again a union of the three types I just mentioned, and we can tell the API which one to use by setting the parameter type. Further, we can specify if we want this parameter to be visible to all shader stages or just to one specific stage. Let's fill in the first root parameter. This parameter describes the number of 32-bit constants that are going to be set in the root signature buffer. For this example, I'm going to use two constants. First, I take a reference to the first element in the array. This is just so that I don't have to type the index every time. For the parameter type, we choose 32-bit constants. It is advisable to minimize shader visibility. So when possible, fill in the specific stage for which you want this parameter to be visible. A root parameter can either be visible to one specific stage or to all of them. As you can see here, it's not possible to logically R these enumerations. So a combination of stages is not possible. We can, however, fine tune this with the root signature flags as we will see later. But in this case, I'm choosing the pixel shader stage. Now we need to describe the constants. We can set the number of constants and to which constant buffer register they are going to be attached. I'll explain registers and register spaces later when we start writing shader programs. For now, I fill in two constants attached to register zero and default register space, which is also zero. That's all for the first root parameter. The next root parameter in our example is a root descriptor. Here we need to specify the descriptor type. Only descriptors of buffer types can be set directly in the root signature, so no textures are supported. Here I'm going to simply use constant buffer view as the type for this root parameter. Similar to what we did for root constants, now we can decide to which register this parameter is attached and in addition, we can set flags for this type of root parameter. Again, we set the shader visibility to finish describing this root parameter. The final root parameter in our example is a root descriptor table. As I mentioned, we can't put descriptors for textures directly in the root signature, so we need to use a range of descriptors in the descriptor heap. In order to do this, we need to use a root descriptor table which can point to one or more descriptor ranges of any descriptor type. In our example, I'm going to use one range that is unbounded. That means that I don't know beforehand how many descriptors will be in that range. This is a wonderful feature that was added in D3D12, which makes it a lot easier to access resources since we don't have to bind them to the pipeline anymore. That's also why it's called bindless resources. So in this case, we have a descriptor table with one range and we need now to define that range. We can do this using D3D12 descriptor range one structure, where we can specify the range and type of descriptors in that range. For our example, I'm going to pretend it's a range of shader resource views that will be used for texturing. Since we are using the bindless technique here, it's important to set the descriptor volatile flag 
for the number of descriptors, I'm using this constant, which is minus one. And basically I'm saying that we don't know how many descriptors are in this range. I also use the same constant for offsetting descriptors from table start. Finally, we set the pointer to this range in the descriptor table. If we had multiple ranges, then we could do the same thing with it with this root parameter array and use the pointer to its first element instead. This concludes defining the root parameters. Next is the static sampler. We need to fill in a D3D12 static sampler desk for this. It is quite straightforward, so I'll just fill in a couple of data members and set the shader visibility. Of course, it is not necessary to set all shader visibilities to the same stage. For example, I can set shader visibility for the root descriptor parameter to vertex. That way it won't be visible for any other stages than the vertex shader stage. Now the only thing that's left to do is to set the number of root parameters, number of static samplers, and the corresponding pointers to the arrays containing those objects. However, before doing that, let me draw your attention to the flags that we can set for the root signature. As you can see here, we can deny access to a root signature for any combination of shader stages. This in combination with shader visibility flag of individual root parameters makes it possible to expose the root parameter to a specific combination of stages. For example, when shader visibility all is chosen in the root parameter, then we could expose it to only vertex shader and geometry shader stages by logically ORing these flags. In general, I'm going to deny access to pretty much all stages except the ones that need the root parameters. In this case, we deny all stages except the vertex and pixel shader stages. And as the last step, we set the rest of the data members. The root signature is released when the renderer shuts down or whenever we don't need it anymore. In the meanwhile, we can use it during rendering. In fact, now we can go ahead and call this function during initialization of the renderer to create a root signature. First, I need to add a function declaration here so we can call it in the initialization function. Let's also add a nice to-do comment so I won't forget to remove it later. And here I can call the function. Set a breakpoint and inspect the parameters. As you can see here, for each parameter, the corresponding data structure has been initialized. Then the version root signature description is serialized and using the result, the final root signature is created. Of course, none of this is used anywhere and we immediately release all interfaces when we exit this function. One thing to be aware of when you're filling in root parameters is that there can be no overlap in shader registers. For example, if I change the shader visibility of the second parameter here to shader visibility pixel, then because the first and second parameters are both exposed as constant buffers to the pixel shader, we need to make sure that they are attached to different registers. Right now, they both use register B0, and this is an error that is caught by the serialization function, as you can see here. We can either change the register value or the register space of one of the parameters to fix this issue. Looking at this function as an example of creating a root signature, I think we all agree that even in this simple case of just three root parameters, we spent an uncomfortably long time typing this code. And it's even worse knowing that we will need many different root signatures to do any non-trivial rendering. So now that we know the steps, I can try and write some helpers that will let us do the same with much less typing. In the next video, I'm going to write these helpers.
I'm also going to do the same steps for pipeline state objects. That is, I'm going to show you how to create one and then write helpers to do that with less typing. Well, that's it for today. I would like to give a huge thanks to my patrons on Patreon who are making this series go forward. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.